you from paycheck to pension. If you're ready to take your finances to the next level, you're in the right place. It's time to take control of your future, starting now, and we're doing it live. Hi, we're the Stidhams, and our goal is to help you get self-directed. It's the tax-free income that will shape your legacy. It's wealth, time, and the freedom you deserve. What you're about to learn will enable you to make confident and strategic moves. It means gaining complete control to invest in what you want when you want. We've helped thousands of people just like you. And if they can do it, you can too. So we hope you're ready because it's about time that your money started working for you. And we're so excited that you chose us to show you how. Starting right now. Starting right now. Right now. Welcome, everyone. We still have people coming in. Maybe our intro should be like a little bit longer to give people just a few more moments notice, but I'm sure people from the replay would probably not appreciate that. Right, right. I can do the replay, I mean, the intro form, starting right now. That's the that's my only part, starting right now. <laughs> you have one line, Donna. Right. Starting right now. <laughs> All right, well, what are we talking about tonight? Breaking news, the retirement crisis is here. Uh, that's what everyone's screaming, but what solutions are they offering? Right. Uh, we, uh, we see them offering a lot more chairs at the casino. Is that where you wanna be? Well, obviously not, because you're here with us. You have a seat at our table. And we're gonna go over tonight, it's like the part two to what we've been discussing about the retirement crisis. And tonight we're digging into the non-conventional solutions, the ones that they're not gonna tell you about. Very true. Tag and, it. Yeah, well, and mainly because they don't uh, tell you about it because what, how can they benefit? How can they, um, uh, what can they accomplish off allowing you to be able to have more control over your retirement dollars? The more control you have, the less control they have. The more control you have, the less money they make. So again, this is a world that uh, was introduced to me very late in my career, and I just made it my mission to be able to kind of just share and kind of open this up to uh, those who need it. Um, because you're right, this is this is intentionally left, um, or, you know, behind a, a, a wall that if you kind of don't know where to look, you'll never find it. Yeah. Well, you said if they don't have control, they can't make money. They also can't leverage your dollars that are inside of their system. Right. So it's no different than, you know, chips at a casino. If you are putting your money in and they're just giving you the chips, right, to play with at the table, it doesn't matter. They still have your money and they can still lend that out to other people. So, um, hey, Celeste, I like seeing her. We like seeing people return back and spend time with us. Like it's, this is our hangout. This is this is a new club. This is where all the bikes are in the neighborhood. It's right here <laughs> at our live stream. We're I back love playing that outside. Track. Yeah, that's we right. are back you're playing outside. For, you're looking where everybody else is at. This is it. All the bikes are outside right now. M more bikes are coming in. We got the Kool Aid with a ton of sugar. It's super sweet in here. We got snacks, social snacks, retirement snacks. We've got it. So this is where to be. Share it out. Tell everybody this is this is where you're at on Wednesdays and Sundays because we've got the tea. We are we're, we're we're telling you what they won't tell you, and we're giving you all the secrets. You know what's something really happened? I just want to share with everyone real quick. Something <clears throat> happened today. I was going through like you got a voicemail, and I was listening to it, and I thought that it was kind of an amazing voicemail. To get so do you mind if i just play that really quick i know that's like not par part of our plan I'm, I'm a little bit shocked i'm curious as to what i'm gonna hear so sure maybe i'll wait okay i'll wait i'll wait because i i want to see if other people will call and leave us uh cool voicemails too because i think that would be fun to play them so yeah. um i i was curious because we haven't done this in a while and <sighs> i didn't grab it do you have a boat by you i do okay I want to start by sharing this story because I think that this leads into all of the solutions that we're going to talk about because it requires to go outside of the box. It requires to um, think of things differently and it's really like 
starts with the mindset and where you are in your commitment level to your goals, right? So we got these boats and this this boat has been kind of a significant, like a, I would say a visual representation of this sentiment that is super motivating inside of our household. And the question is, will this make the boat go faster? It's based off of this story, uh, this book. It's based off a true story of this, I think it was a German rowing team. team. Yep, rowing team. And they had never won the Olympics. They'd never gone to the Olympics. They wanted to win. And so the coach said, okay, we're going to win this year. Then we have to ask ourselves before we do anything at all, will this make the boat go faster? Because everything we do has to lead to us winning the goal, right? Winning the Olympics. So before they went to eat something, before they went to bed, they were going to stay up later, or their friend had a birthday party, or whatever the case was, they would ask themselves, will this make the boat go faster? If the answer was no, then everyone had committed to not doing it. Nope, we're not going to do it. So inside of our house, like even in our family, we ask this question all the time, like, okay, that's interesting. Will it make your boat go faster? Will it make our boat go faster? Right? And sometimes you have to assess like who's inside of your boat and are they standing in your boat and kind of like rocking it and making it harder or maybe they're paddling in a different direction and that's why you're just kind of going in circles. Maybe an audit is required in order to make your boat go faster. Anywho, we have these, and this is something that we had intended to do for a while now is, and we tried in the very, very beginning to give these away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start picking just random people out of our email list because you guys have already opted in. You guys are already showing us some love just to see who uh, we can send a boat. You win a boat. So you tune in, you could win a boat, and we will send you our little package of, um, kind of a reminder, it's got the story in there to ask yourself and as, as your reminder to ask yourself, will whatever it is that you do, keep in, keeping aligned with making your boat go faster. And here's the cool part about that, uh, okay. especially if you have others on your team who are in the boat with you, uh, rather than it, it, it becoming uh, like this accusatory situation where, hey, you're not doing what you're, you said you were going to do, it's an opportunity to maybe reset, reevaluate, reassess, hey, are we aligned in what the, our objectives are and are we all focused in the same direction? So it's not that you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Maybe you got distracted. Maybe this task became a little bit harder than you thought it was going to be. So therefore, we just need to sit back. Let's talk about it. No one's, no one's upset. No one's pointing any fingers. It's, hey, this is where the boat is headed. Are we aligned in where this boat is going? And so are we on the same page? And so it's, it became a metaphor that allows us to be able to have more, I'll call it in-depth discussions around what the objectives are and where we're headed versus it becoming uh, this argument or this contentious situation around uh, our objectives and our goals. So. Yeah. And we have them kind of all over the house and it's it's easy <clears throat> to look at this and then go, Am I, is what I'm doing right now helping the boat go faster? And sometimes it just is a, like a magnet for getting you, uh, your compass recalibrated to head in the direction you want to go. So, absolutely. Yes, I wanted to, to at least share that. And on that note, we used to do this by starting with the game. And so I think maybe we can, we could do that today. Totally up to you. Whatever my producer wants to do. Yeah, will you guys um, put in the chat if you're down to play a game with us? Hey, Andrew. See folks over here on LinkedIn. Uh, let me find, okay, here we go. Well, it's gonna take seven seconds for them to come in. I'm gonna say yes. You guys wanna play a game? <laughs> the producer said yes. Yes, all right, I'm excited. Let's do it. <sighs> Okay, you ready? I am. All right. Oh, Have I seen these questions before? Um, I, th I think maybe you have. Okay. Because I like to participate too. So. Yeah, but maybe you, you would have forgotten by now. Okay, are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, can you guys hear that sound? Mm -hmm. No? Yes, we can hear. Okay. I can. All right. 
The average amount of income Americans earn in retirement is A, 25 to 35, B, 40 to 75, C, 75 to 100, D, 50 to 65K. Hmm. For those who are playing on the TV or at home, okay, Greg says he's down. All right, everyone's like, yes, yes, let's do it. All right, so put it in the chat what you think the answer is. I've got an A. I've got several A's. Greg says A. Okay. Celeste says A. Save to Serve says A. Looks like A is unanimous. Can so that's guys, a positive, right? Can you guys hear that? I can't hear it very well. You kill me getting distracted by sounds. I know, but I it's because it's important. Why why play it if I can't hear it? If you can't hear it. Guess who's frozen though? Yeah. You know what? We were gonna play um our live stream bingo and put on there that John L's camera gets frozen because this is like a totally random. We never know what's going to happen. And we have to, I think we have to send his camera into Canon. Um, okay. Well, we're, we'll keep playing. You just come back when you can. Okay. I'd love to. All right. What percentage of Americans can actually achieve $1 million or more in retirement? 4%, 27%, 8.8% or 99.9%? Now, this is a trick question because with traditional strategies, it's only 8.8%. But if you're using non-conventional strategies, then it's 99.9% .9 because everybody should be able to uh, achieve retirement and a significant retirement income. So... It was kind of a trick question, but you guys are doing great so far. I love that you guys are already, you're already into it. Okay, next one. The average American has this much retire saved in retirement. 250, 140, 500, or 1 million. Average American. What do you guys think? Are you back? You're back. Okay, specifically 141,542. That's it. That's by the time you have hit retirement age, this is the majority of what people have saved. We're here to change that. That's our goal. Okay, next one. How Hi, much? By the way. What? Hi. Yeah, I said you're back. You didn't hear me though. How much is how much is the true average annual income for a retiree? Now I've kind of said this a lot actually in the past like few live streams. Not including social security. Do you remember you well, you know what this one is, right? I do. Okay. Yeah, that's a It really speaks to um the tool. So it's not that, uh, I'm sorry, it really speaks to who owns the tool or who has the tool, who has your retirement account. It's really uh, less about uh, whether your 401k or IRA or 403b or TSP is designed for income or capable of producing income. It's really based off where it is. It's sad. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. Yeah. Greg says he's got four on it. <laughs> that's that's what he's got for it. Okay. Um, it's hard for me to do the comments and the, the game. So can you do one? Uh, sure. I don't know what that means, but. Do the comments. Oh, actually, that's yeah, it. Do the comments. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. So um, we can we can stay uh, there. OK, let's I'll play the thing later so we can we can um, move forward. We do have a fair amount of slides to get. Yeah. through. So um, let's go ahead and kind of jump in. That's OK. Yep, I agree. So for those who are just now joining in, we have um, already talked about what happened with the retirement uh, crisis, how it happened, how it could have been avoided. And now we are going to show you some of the non-conventional tools that most people are just aren't aware of. Right, Donnell? Absolutely. And just to kind of simply set the stage, um, what we had, what the conclusion that I was hoping people would come to based off uh, the live from a few days ago around the retirement crisis is um, what do you do? 
And most of the videos or uh, social media posts I've seen around this subject talks about there is a crisis, but no one really shares what are those actions you can take based off the current control you have around the vehicles that you have, current vehicles that you have, what are those actions that you can take? And so what we just wanted to do was one, highlight why there's a crisis, what, it, what what's causing the crisis, and the moral of the story there, and we'll get into more detail is, most of the retirement vehicles we use today are tied to the stock market. So therefore, um, you know, it, it runs great with the stock market, but also loses with the stock market. So therefore, the security is lost. And so, so it's less about the vehicles, the fact that it's tied to the market. So what are the actions you can take? Reduce the risk. If you can reduce the risk inside of your traditional retirement account, we can get to a better place. And so what I wanted to do today is just walk through some of those vehicles that maybe we haven't spent a lot of time talking about on this live. to kind of highlight what some of those actions that can be taken are uh, to help reduce that risk. So yep. we can jump over to the vibe board if you All want. All right. Yeah. All right. Let me just um, make sure it's got a fun thing, and then we'll send John over. All right. Thank you guys for playing, by the way. All right. So, again, uh, from a – oops. Hey, you're back. Um, why is it doing this? <laughs> this is not okay. Okay. I'm not doing this, by the way. This is this program. Let me try one more time. Okay. Second time's got to be a charm. I promise. My hands are up and off of everything. I swear. All right. So from a retirement crisis perspective, again, this is really about the reason things are the way they are is because we, as the individuals who have these retirement accounts, have very little control. So the thought process was, you know, why is that? What's causing that? And so if you kind of dig into the details, what you learn is even though you might have a, uh, a 401k that's called a, a savings plan. The truth is your retirement account is really more of an investment plan if it's tied to the market, meaning there is the, the in, an investment plan and a savings plan has have two different types of equations. And so hopefully you can notice it here. The difference between this equation and this equation, even though it's very slight, there is a significant difference between the two. And that difference is right here. The difference between these two equations, these two equations are the difference between linear growth, meaning I add and subtract, oh, I'm sorry, I average the wins and losses of my account, to, which equates to a straight line or a line of growth, hopefully in the positive direction, compared to uninterrupted compound interest. The difference between these two, two accounts or these two types of um, investment accounts or accounts in general are the difference between this sign and this sign. One, this minus, oh, this minus sign in the first equation equates to risk. So the thought process is this. If you can eliminate the risk, or maybe not eliminate the risk, if you can reduce the risk, you have a better chance of being able to achieve uninterrupted compound interest. And it brings up another point. And it kind of speaks to some of the feedback that I'd received uh, this week. Usually when people reach out to me, it's for one of these strategies, um, a self-directed IRA or 401k, velocity banking, a first position HELOC, infinite banking or MPI. And usually when I have someone reach out to me, very rarely will I, um, uh, I'll call it, push them in a direction. If you call me about a self-directed retirement account, we're going to talk about a self-directed retirement account. And if you if, if there, there are certain cues that I listen for, if the reason you're calling isn't the true reason, meaning as we peel layers back and I ask you about your goal, if, if you highlight the fact that, you know what, I'm only doing this because I thought this was my only option, then I will share other options with you. But it, it found it, I find it interesting that a lot of people who I offer or I create self-directed IRAs and 401ks for don't know that I also offer life insurance. And it's mainly because if you call me specifically wanting a specific thing, that's what we're going to talk about. That is my job. My job is to provide you what you ask for. And now, again, when you 
the kind of, I'll call it drop some key words, then that tells me actually what you're looking for is something different. And then we dig into those details. So what I wanted to share with you is um, those of you who may be listening to me thinking you're only going to hear about velocity banking or listening to me thinking you're only going to hear about a secure compound interest account. The truth is there are many actions that can be taken here. And so what I wanted to highlight today as it relates to the retirement crisis is this. The, the opportunity or the objective is to be able to reduce risk. How can you reduce risk with your current or, or, or previous employer retirement accounts? Because a lot of people think, hey, I've got this previous IRA, previous 401k, previous 403b from another employer. I just need to roll it into my current employer and continue on with the same risk that I've always had. Most people don't realize you have options. You actually have the ability to take control over your previous previous retirement account. So I just wanted to highlight that as an action that can be taken to be able to assist in getting yourself out of this retirement crisis. So that's kind of the main goal of today is to kind of highlight that. And again, when when we look at those two different um, those two different equations, what is it that we're looking at? What we're basically saying is, hold on, let me do that. What we're basically saying is, hey, the goal is to reduce the risk. So when we're looking at investment plans like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, TSPs, government 457 plans, compared to savings plans that produce uninterrupted compound interest, what is the difference? And there is a significant difference. A lot of it is related to fees. Most of traditional retirement accounts are riddled with fees. We've done many videos about this. We've shared many videos on this platform talking about the fees inside of your traditional accounts. And those fees tend to eat up two thirds of your retirement, meaning the reason one of the reasons the four percent rule is in place is so that you don't run out of money. Well, if you had two thirds of the amount that you're supposed to have, couldn't we increase that four percent? But you don't because your 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 accounts are just inherently riddled with fees. That's how the Fidelities, the Vanguards, the Morgan Stanleys make their profit. And it's something that you have very little control over. And so the, the objective then would be to do what you can to reduce those fees, actively managed, meaning um, right now, some of you might even have what's called a self-directed account with a Fidelity, meaning you can actually self-direct your Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, Vanguard, company retirement plan. But what that means is you can actually invest in any of the mutual fund stocks and bonds they offer. When you hear me say self-direct, when you hear me say take control, what I am referencing is not only can you invest in those mutual fund stocks and bonds that they might offer, but you can also invest in non-traditional investments, non-traditional investments, meaning investments outside of the market. Well, if I can get my retirement account outside of the market, there may be an opportunity to reduce risk. And therefore, there may be an opportunity for me to be able to beat the 4% rule. So again, the objective is to take a previous employer's retirement account and see if you can't turn this investment equation into more of a savings equation. And you turn that investment equation into a savings equation by simply reducing the risk. And to kind of further highlight that is, you know, there's, I, I, I kind of, I was very curious as to how many companies or how many Americans actually still have a pension available. Uh, because a lot of people think we are in this pension era, but we're not. There's a, I think the number was like 20% of Americans actually have a pension. So we're talking, you know, people who work for the county, people who work for the state, people who work for the federal government and some of your uh, I'll call it uh, like FedEx. There's there's some st still some key companies out there that still offer pensions, but that's only 20 percent of Americans and everyone else. Most of us, majority of us have a 401k, a 403b, uh, a SEP IRA, something along those lines. Well, we're actually headed into a different era and that er that era is around having control a self-directed retirement account, a self-directed retirement plan, and a SCIA, a secure compound interest account. Why? Because it allows you more control. And the more control you have, the less likely you are to be subject to risk. And now I'm not saying you can eliminate the risk, meaning 
if you were to self-direct, meaning control your previous employer's plan and dump it into, into crypto, you're kind of taking uh, an investment account that has risk in it for another account that has even more risk. So, and again, nothing against those who invest in crypto. My point is you have the ability with control to reduce risk. It doesn't mean you eliminate it all. So my point to that is when you hear me talk about a, a self-directed retirement account, what I'm talking about is control. I am simply talking about adding control to something that you currently have little control over. And for that, what I simply just wanted to highlight is some of the differences between, let me get a little bit bigger. Some of the differences between when you hear me talk about it, a self-directed IRA compared to a self-directed 401k. What is it? What am I talking about? And what does it allow you to have when you have one? Because I do get a lot of calls from clients who have a previous employer's plan. Maybe they've watched one of my YouTube videos on uh, the differences between an IRA and a 401k. And I get a lot of calls around, hey, I am interested in a self-directed IRA. When I ask the very simple question, why? Most people don't know why. They just know they want control. They just know they want to move their money from where it is. They don't want to roll their previous employer's plan into their current employer's plan. And they want to do something else with it. They want to have more control over their retirement dollars. And so in just talking through the differences between an IRA and 401k, that kind of helps people understand what's actually available to you. So what I wanted to highlight, and I know I'm moving really fast, but what I wanted to highlight is some of the differences between a self-directed IRA compared to a self-directed 401k. Meaning, if you have a previous employer's plan, you have the ability to remove that previous employer's plan from the market and do something else with it. Now, there's a select type of individuals that, th that I'm speaking to. There are active investors and there are passive investors. There are people who know they know they have an action that they want to take. They just have very little control over their retirement dollars to be able to do so. So what do they end up doing? They end up withdrawing money from their retirement account, paying the tax, paying the penalty, pillaging that retirement account to be able to go do that other thing because they have an idea, they have an action that they want to take, but no one has really educated them on how to do it without being taxed and penalized. So creating a self-directed retirement account Self-directed meaning control, creating a self-directed retirement account allows you to take that previous employer's plan and take that action. So again, what I'm referencing is the difference between an, an active investor versus a passive investor. I am talking about today how to help an active investor take control. And so if we're talking about a previous employer's plan, like an IRA, the problem with IRAs is they don't have the structure required for you to be able to take control over them. And so creating a self-directed IRA requires some steps. And again, another way of, of, of relating to your current previous employer's plan or your previous employer's plan that you might have moved into an IRA or your previous employer's plan is currently sitting there collecting dust. What we would have to do is move that IRA into a new one because your IRA lacks the ability to actually uh, allow you to be able to control it. So what we have to do is move it into a new IRA and then that IRA itself, the IRA has to purchase an LLC. Meaning we move the IRA into a new self-directed IRA just for starters. And then that IRA has to purchase an LLC. And usually what I get from people is, can I use an LLC that already exists? And you cannot. Your IRA has to purchase that LLC, meaning the LLC is owned by the IRA. When that happens, any of you who know anything about an LLC, um, an LLC has what's called an EIN number. So when you, we move your IRA to that new custodian and that new custodian, uh, and then we create that LLC inside of that IRA, LLCs have what's called an EIN number. An EIN number is no different than your social security number. 
So with that social security number, with that EIN number of that LLC, we are now able to open a checkbook. We're open to open up a checking account that is tied directly to that LLC, which allows the IRA, the dollars in that IRA to then be transferred through the LLC into this checkbook. So we're able to move your IRA dollars from your new uh, self-directed IRA into the checkbook that is owned by this LLC. In the midst of doing that, again, once we move your IRA to, from where they are today, let's say Fidelity, into a new self-directed IRA sitting with a passive custodian, or at least a custodian that charges less fees. And once that IRA itself creates a brand new LLC, the EIN number of that LLC allows you now the ability to open up a checkbook, open up a checking account, right? I keep saying checkbook, open up a check checking account. And when you open up that checking account, you now have full control over all of the money that was sitting in that previous employer's plan initially. And now when that money is sitting in that checking account, what are you able to do with it? What are you, what are you able to use that money for? Well, we'll get to that. But what I wanted to highlight is that's a self-directed IRA. What's the difference between a self-directed IRA and a self-directed 401k? Like what, what, what is the process for creating one? What makes it different? Well, there is a significant difference between an IRA and a 401k. First off, again, IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account, IRA. An individual retirement account is simply a glorified savings account. Whereas the 401k, the 401k is actually a trust. And if you know anything about trust, trusts have their own EIN number, meaning the structure of a 401k alone is sufficient enough for you to be able to take control. But the reason you can't take control today with the company 401k you may have or that 401k that's sitting with Fidelity, the only reason you can't take control today is because Fidelity won't allow it. It's because the company you work for won't allow it. And again, who benefits by you not having control is the question that you want answered. So again, for 401k, a 401k is already structured to have control. It already comes with its own EIN number. So what we do, is we move your current or your uh, previous employer plan sitting at whatever that custodian might be. And custodian is just a fancy word for bank. So if it's sitting at Vanguard, sitting at Fidelity, sitting in Morgan Stanley, wherever it's sitting, we create and move th that money into a new self-directed 401k. And when we move it into this self-directed 401k, the structure of the self-directed 401k means it has its own EIN number. And again, EIN number just means it's no different than a social. So we take that EIN number, open up a checking account. Once we link the checking account to your new self-directed 401k, you now have full control over all of those dollars. Once you have control over your previous employer's plans, that means you can literally use them for whatever you want. Now there's rules that you have to abide by. But notice what I, you didn't hear me say. When I moved money from that previous custodian into your new 401k, was there any taxes involved? No. Was there any penalty involved because, hey, I, I'm under the age 50 or 59 and a half. Is there any um, penalty involved with me moving that money from the previous custodian, Fidelity, Vanguard, Morgan Stanley, into the new 401k? Was there any penalty? Absolutely not. And here's how you know there's no penalty. When you had your original account, when you had this original account sitting in whatever that company was that you left, when the, your new company said, hey, you can move your previous reti retirement dollars into this new place, was there, is there, was there ever a cost to doing so? Was there ever any tax implications in doing, for, doing so? And the answer is no. So you can move retirement dollars between other retirement vehicles, penalty-free, tax-free, all day long. And there's no tax or penalty impact by you doing so. So this is no different. The major difference is you control it compared to Fidelity or that bank. You get to say where that money does or doesn't go compared to that, uh, that, that, that custodian.
So that's the biggest difference here. So again, IR, difference between an IRA and 401k, 401k has its own EIN number. So there's a step missing. You do not, it is not required for the 401k to purchase an LLC for you to have checkbook control. That is the piece that has to be acknowledged here. Other than that, there are other significant differences. Let's see here. I just really want to quickly, yes. for, for those who may have just come in, yes. the reason why we're going over a self-directed IRA or 401k and these options is because we're talking about how you can take control and get your money out of the market so that you can invest in what you want, when you want. Absolutely. Now, one thing I just, because uh, there's a couple comments of where like I can't access my 401k and you had mentioned the previous employer. What if someone right. is trying to access and wants to pull their money out if they have a uh, their current. current employer? Yeah. Yep. So there are select companies out there. I've seen military do it. I've seen, actually I've seen Google do it. Um, there are select companies, I've seen the AT&T do it. I've seen there are select companies out there that depending on how much you have in your account, um, they see it as a win to allow you to do what's called an in-service transfer. Meaning while you're still working for them, they will allow you to take a portion of your retirement and move it wherever you would like. Now, what's the benefit to them to doing so. Well, if you have a large account, the benefit to them is they re get to re remove some of that um, cost off their books. So they see it as a win because now they get to spend less money on you because of the match or whatever the reason might be. So there are companies out there that will allow it. Otherwise, when you work for the company that you work for, you do not control your retirement account. They do. You do not determine when you can or can't use the money in it. They do. So therefore, if they won't allow what's called an in-service transfer, the only way you can access your current employer's dollars is by leaving that company. And there's really no other way around that. Last week, we talked about the increase for retirement age or the uh, minimum, the age for minimum distributions. We also talked about the, the inflation hike and the uh, because of the retirement crisis, the tax implications that are coming in the next 10 years that will be upon all of us to pay for that those deficits, right? right? If you have your money in your employer's or some employer's um, traditional retirement vehicle, then every single rule that they come down with will be yeah. applied be to you. By. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you will have, you'll be at the mercy of whatever rules they decide. So if the market crashes and then they make up more rules, like, um, for instance, that the, the tax hike is really the biggest piece that I just want to make sure that we keep in mind while we're going through these solutions, because some of these feel like, well, it's just easier to leave my money in this traditional vehicle because I've never had to be an active investor before. So this, and not all of these are for everybody. That's why this isn't not one size fits all, right? Right. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring it to the surface because we have to be clear here. This is, this is not a one size fits all. This fits a, a select type of individual. If you're looking to put your money away and sleep well at night to, and, and just be happy with the fact that your money is growing, um, a self-directed retirement account is not for you because if you take your money from a previous employer or do an in-service transfer from a current employer and move it into a self-directed account, it's sitting there collecting dust. It's not even collecting the 0.02% that your savings account would be, would be uh, increasing. So you have to be willing and able to take this money and do something with it. Now, what you can do with it is almost unlimited. Yeah, because but you do I, have to be willing. Go ahead. And I think that's the part is, you know, I don't know that I thought we weren't going to get into the weeds with all of this, but I see you added some things. And yeah, so you have to tell a story. Okay. And the story that has to be told here is there is a significant difference between an IRA and a 401k. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. Most of the calls I get are for people who actively want to take advantage of their previous employer's plan and do something with it. 
Mm -hmm. And they traditionally call for a self-directed IRA, not understanding the differences between an IRA and a 401k. So what I don't want to do is leave the audience hanging on, okay, a self-directed retirement account is a self-directed retirement account is a self-directed retirement account. It is not. An IRA and a 401k are different. And just high level, what are those differences? An IRA is just a glorified savings account and it requires a bank in order for you to have control. And because it requires a custodian, because it requires a bank, what does that imply? Requiring a bank implies that it requires fees. This is where uh, we play the video around the retirement gam gamble and the more, the, um, you know, your, your retirement account being eaten up by two thirds of the fees because of the custodian that it's with. An IRA requires a custodian. Now, a self-directed IRA allows us to reduce those custodial fees but we cannot eliminate those custodial fees. Case in point, the difference between an IRA and a 401k, a 401k does not require a custodian. You do not need a bank to have a 401k. But let's be real frank, you don't want your 401k dollar sitting anywhere other than a bank. But what that allows is it allows us to negotiate those fees and eliminate them. Okay. So we are able to eliminate custodial fees with a 401k. Okay, well, keep we'll keep going. I think for most people, they're probably going, well, how does this help me? How, how can I use it? You just got to be patient because you have to first understand that there's a difference. And then I can absolutely walk you through how having a different 401k can actually hit, allow you to hit your goal and get out of that retirement crisis. But just walking in thinking I can have a self-directed IRA and do so won't get you there. Okay, well, we're, we're, ha we're hanging in here, Donnell. We, we really so. want to know. Okay, so. I'm going to I'm going to send you back. All right. Okay, and you're back. Thank you. So an IRA. So one of the other things to note about an IRA compared to a 401k is contribution limits, meaning since probably the 80s, I don't know that the contribution limits on a uh, IRA has really changed much. It's currently 65 and 7,500. And I think when I started looking at IRAs, it was 6,000 and 7,000. So it hasn't improved much. But the contribution limits for a uh, 401k is the major difference. You have the ability to put away about $73,500 into a 401k if you're, 50, if you're over the age of 50 compared to 7,500 inside of an IRA. The contribution limits are significant. Uh, the ability to borrow against your 401k is significant, meaning... If you have a self-directed 401k and there are actions that you want to take that have nothing to do with your retirement account and you're below that age where you're old enough to actually access your money without penalty. Well, if any of you have a 401k, you know, you can borrow against it. Well, what if you had your own 401k that you can borrow against? What that allows you to do is that allows you to set whatever terms you want within reason to be able to borrow those dollars and, and the timing on which you pay them back. You don't have that option with an IRA. With a 401k, you can co-mingle funds. And most of the people that I work with have worked for many different companies, which means they may have multiple previous employer plans, which means you can co-mingle all of those previous employers' plans into the, same, into the same account, which now gives you a much larger pool to be able to contend with, much larger pool to be able to pull from. But an IRA, one, they can't be real. you can't do that. And the piece that I just want to make sure is clear here, when you're talking about investing in a previous employer's plan, using a previous employer's plan to invest, what you're investing in and how you invest matters. Meaning there are taxes involved with how you use your previous employer's plans that you have to be aware of. And the biggest is this little thing called UBIT, unrelated business income tax. UBIT is a 35 to 37% tax that only impacts IRAs and do not, does not impact 401ks. So just having a 401k allows you to save 35 to 37% in taxes just by having it, which is very significant. Sorry, I had my phone all queued up for the voicemail and I forgot it was plugged in. Oh, no problem. Uh, on no there. Problem. I, we have a question if you if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just It was a while ago and I didn't want to miss it. Sure. Ann would like to know if you have a 401k with your current employer and you turn 59 and a half, can you move your money tax free as well? So the company matters, but for in my experience, the answer is yes. Uh, I have several clients who the spouse has a self-directed self -direct, self retirement account 
And when the other spouse who's still working, who's younger, hits 59 and a half, they immediately go grab that that spouse's uh, current employer's plan and move it to a uh, self-directed retirement account, again, in the form of an in-service transfer. Um, so I, the short answer to that question is yes, but I would have to believe it depends on the, on, on the employer. Good question. Okay. Yep. All right. So the last thing I wanted to highlight here is, is custodians. And I speak a lot about custodians. And a custodian is just a fancy word for bank. Now, the uh, type that allo allows you to only invest in what they have, those are active custodians, like th the banks we know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, um, Fidelity, meaning you can invest in what they have to offer only. They do not offer land. They don't offer anything outside of stock market-based investments. But then there's another type of active investor or an active custodian, which is those who allow you to invest in what you want, but you have to get their approval. And specifically, those are named like, uh, there's a equity trust is one that comes to mind because I get, um, I get served their ads a lot and I don't know why, but equity trust is one that comes to mind. IRA services, there's a lot of uh, di uh, directed IRA. There's a lot of them out there and they allow you to invest in what you want, meaning you get to choose what the vehicle is you want to invest in, but you have to get their approval. And for any of you who are thinking about becoming an investor, if you're waiting on some bank to give you the approval to invest in what you've already done your investigation on, you lose time. And in an investor's world, you don't have time because there's a lot of other people who are trying to get that same opportunity that you're trying to take advantage of. And then the last one is passive investors. These are the ones that we use for our self-directed retirement accounts. Passive investors are just that. Your money is sitting in their bank. It's FDIC insured. It's protected. But, but as far as them having any access or any say over what you do with your money, they don't. And those are the types of custodians that we use. And again, if you're using the right custodian, that allows you to be able to take action where otherwise you traditionally would not. And Again, so for this world that most of you may not be aware of that I'm in, if you were to Google self-directed 401k, once you get past the ads, you would find a company called self-directed retirement plans. Every self-directed retirement account I create is through self-directed retirement plans, which is a company I'm a part owner in. This is a company that's been around 20 plus years. There's only two people a part of this company, me and my partner, Rick. And a lot of you who have reached out to me ended up talking to Rick, talking about velocity banking and life insurance based products, which he has no idea what you're talking about because he has his skill set and I have mine. And mine is around not just self-directed retirement accounts, but it, it ventures into other things. But my point is this, if you were to Google self-directed 401k and once you get past the ads, you'd find us there on the first page of Google and we're there organically. We don't pay for ads. We don't do anything special to get there. We just do a good job for our clients. And so if you have a previous employer's plan and you're looking to be able to take action, this is just simply where you start. And again, you're either going to get me or you're going to get Rick. So what I would like to do is move into a quick example to just kind of highlight how you can use a self-directed retirement account to be able to take action. And this example is kind of based on an, uh, an actual client of mine. And I threw in a, a few different variables because I want to make sure we get the full breadth of what the opportunity would be. In addition, I also picked one path. There are many different solutions here. No different than infinite banking. There are many different actions that can be taken with a previous employer's account. But I just wanted to highlight uh, a specific path to kind of give you an idea as to what's available to you because they may give you an idea as to what you can do with your previous retirement account, previous employer's plan to be able to do something special. So the example goes like this. Gentleman's 80, uh, 35. He's in IT. I get a lot of clients in their early to mid to late thirties who are in it. I don't know what it is about it, but there's a lot of them and there's a lot of people moving jobs in it. So he's 35 years of age, just starting a new role at a new it company. He's leaving his previous employer's plan with hundred K in it. And the question is, what should I do? And again, the title of today's live is there's a retirement crisis going on. So the objective is how do I get beyond this retirement crisis with this hundred thousand dollars I have from a previous employer and I'm actually headed into another employer who's going to offer a 401k. 
Right. We can't retire on hope. Right. And so the thought process is this um, should because he's currently putting away. Well, with his previous employer, he was putting away 12 percent of his income. He makes 100K a year. 12 percent of 100K is uh, 12 grand. 12 grand a year is a thousand dollars a month. So he was uh, in his previous employer's plan. He was putting away twelve thousand dollars a year. The question to me is, should he continue? Should he start contributing to his new employer's 401k at a thousand dollars a month? So that's question number one. Then question number two, man, I've got this previous employer's plan. Should I roll over? Should I transfer my previous employer's hundred thousand dollars into my new company's retirement account? And the reason he reached out to me is because he wanted to take control over that hundred thousand. So what can he do? What should he do? What is the opportunity to take advantage of that hundred thousand dollars of that previous employer's plan, not pay tax, not pay penalty, but still be able to take control over those dollars to get it out of the market, to have more control and reduce risk. So um, I think one of the other cool parts about this, and that may be the next slide, so what he would like to do, and this is what most people who reach out to me want to do is they want to become real estate investors. And so the question being asked is, can I take action? Can I take action in this real estate environment and use my previous employer's plan to be able to invest in real estate? Well, there's some structure that needs to happen, meaning you just can't magically take your previous employer's plan and invest in real estate. So we do have to apply some structure. And if you know anything about this channel, I focus on strategy and structure. And that structure looks like taking that previous employer's plan and creating a self-directed 401k. But in doing so, would it be possible to be able to purchase this duplex in St. Louis, Missouri for 179,000? I've got 100,000 in my 401k. The goal is to purchase a duplex for 179. And for my math people out there who may be saying there's no way you can purchase a duplex for $179,000, again, these are not my numbers. I just wanna make sure we're clear. It is absolutely something you can do. You can Zillow it yourself. There's a lot of opportunities out there, depending on where you live, where you can use a portion of your retirement dollars to be able to invest in real estate. <clears throat> this is the actual property that he's looking at. Is that you over there playing on my screen? I appreciate that. Um, so this is the exact property that he's looking at. So here's the thought process. Just kind of break it down a little bit. And again, I know I'm moving really fast. He's got $100,000 that we've just created a self-directed 401k for, meaning he just can't take his previous employer's plan and do anything with it. We have to create the structure. So the structure that we've created is we've created that self-directed 401k, move that $100,000 into it, and now he has checkbook control over that $100,000 to take action. The action he wants to take is to purchase this property. Now, there are many actions here. If any of my real estate investors are on this live, there are many actions you can take with this $100,000. I'll, I'll throw one out that we're not going over. What if he split that $100,000 into thirds and purchased three duplexes, all worth $180,000? Would that be possible? Mm. If you put down 5%. Right. Right. If he put down just five percent, if he yep. took care of the closing costs and he probably still have about 15 grand to uh, do rehab. Like right. there are many actions you can hear take over here with this hundred thousand. Yes. The example that I'm doing does not sound logical around taking all hundred thousand, dumping it into one property and then bridging that gap, which with what's called a non recourse loan. And there's a reason why I'm doing this non and I'm, I'm being specific non recourse loan. What do I mean? So he's got a hundred thousand dollars in his 401k. The property that needs to be purchased is 180,000. You can't just run out with a hundred thousand and buy that $180,000 property. There's a gap. There's a gap of 80 grand. How do you close that gap? There's many different ways but they are all done through a non recourse loan. And here's what I mean. Who is actually buying this property? Is this gentleman buying the property or is the self-directed 401k buying the property? 
So here's the piece that is very critical around using a, a, a re retirement account to invest in non-traditional investments. You are, you personally are what's called a disqualified person. What that means is you can't be involved with your retirement account, <clears throat> but your retirement account is not a person. So someone has to take action on behalf of the retirement account. And that's where you come in, come into play because a 401k is a trust and you as the trust, or you with the trust are the trustee, meaning the sole decision maker of that trust. So because you're structured properly and because you are allowed to take action for your 401k, when your 401k buys a property, that property is now owned by the 401k. You do not own it. Your social security number will appear nowhere, nowhere on any documents in the purchase of this home. The purchase of this home is being purchased by that 401k. And if you remember, the 401k has an EIN number. So the owner of the property is the EIN number of the 401k. So now there's an $80,000 deficit. How do we bridge that gap? Well, your 401k is allowed to borrow. Your 401k is about, about allowed to borrow in the form of a non-recourse loan. What that means is you can go to a bank, borrow from that bank, that $80,000 gap, and the bank will lend to your 401k. And again, there's a lot here and I'm not going into a lot of detail. We can go into that detail at a later date, but the piece I just want you to understand is that for your 401k is allowed to borrow in the form of a non-recourse loan, which means there are banks out there that will lend to your 401k that money that's missing. And they will lend to it based on the strength of the opportunity. There is no DTI. There's no credit check. There is no down payment owed by you as the individual. They will specifically lend to your 401k based off the opportunity. So now if there's a $180,000, um, duplex out there and you're coming to the table with a hundred thousand of it. And let's say that duplex is also worth upwards of around 180, 190, 200,000. Is there, um, is this a good business decision by the bank is what has to be determined. In addition, they will lend to you based off the an LTV of somewhere around anywhere from 45 to 65%. Again, talking real estate talk. Bottom line is you can borrow against your, uh, using your 401k from a bank. And assuming this happens, that means that the 80,000 you borrowed is the mortgage. And if you just simply do the math, because I've already done it, that mortgage on that five, that $180,000, oh, I'm sorry, the mortgage on the $80,000 remaining is $500 a month. Okay. So you've got a mortgage of $500 a month that is owed on this duplex. And again, I've already done the math. You do a mortgage on a on one hundred eighty thousand. It's actually eleven hundred, eleven hundred dollars a month. But since we put one hundred eighty thousand dollars on it, we only have eighty eighty thousand dollars left. The mortgage on eighty thousand is five hundred dollars a month. Five hundred dollars a month on a duplex worth one hundred eighty thousand. The rent on that duplex in the St. Louis area would yield around twelve hundred dollars a month per side. So thank you. Yeah. You got twelve hundred dollars a month per side. 1200 plus 1200 is $2,400. So you've got $2,400 a month that you're able to bring in and you have a mortgage of $500. That mortgage of $500 deducted from that 2400 leaves you with $1,900 of, 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 I'll call it profit available. Now there's rehab costs. There's tenants, toilets, and trash issues. There's all sorts of, sorts of things that may come out of that 1900. But in general, that's $1,900 a month that is available to you over the next 20 years. So that's that $100,000 um, um, retirement account, that $100,000 self-directed 401k that we were now able to move out of the market, get it out of the fluctuations of the market and get it in position where it's now making you no more money but we forgot about a part. Remember that thousand dollars a month that uh, this individual was, was wondering where we should put it? What do we do with that? Well, what if at age 35, while doing this, we take that $1,200, that 
that was originally going in the company's 401k, we take that $1,200 and we put it in a secure compound interest account. So sweetheart, would you mind moving over to the calculator so we can take a look at what $1,200, I'm sorry, $1,200 a year, I'm, uh, uh, hold on, a $12,000 a year, which is $1,000 a month, is what he was originally thinking of contributing to his new employer. So if we take that $1,000 a month, which is $12,000 a year and put that into a secure compound interest account. So there's two things happening here. We've taken the $100,000 from his previous employer. We've got that working. And instead of investing in his new company's 401k at $1,000 a month, 12% is what he's, he was contributing. We're going to take that $1,000 a month and dump that into a secure compound interest account. All Notice. Right. I don't have him making more money. We're not using anything additional. We're just simply taking what was going into his current employer's plan, getting that out of the market, reducing the risk, dumping it into a secure compound interest account, and then taking that $100,000, reducing the risk. Now, I didn't say eliminate because real estate, there's still a risk, but re uh, reducing that risk, moving it into a, uh, a property and growing that. So, yep, let's jump over. So what does $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year look like for this same 35 year old? And we're going to allow it to compound for 20 years. So again, two actions, taking the $1,000 a month that he was going to dump into his employer's plan, dump that into a secure compound interest account, and then taking his previous employer's plan and putting it in real estate. What does that look like? Well, by age 55, and that's age 55, which is before retirement age, meaning he could not even think about this $73,000 tax-free for life inside of his regular retirement account. But if for 20 years at age 55, he would have $73,000 tax-free for the rest of his life on top of the $456,000 asset that he had been receiving $2,000, uh, what is that, $1,900 a month in profit from his real estate venture. Right. Now, I haven't even talked about what he could do with that $1,900, right? He right. could also buy more properties using that, but we're not even talking about that. I just want to just highlight two things. One, taking that $100,000, putting it to work, and then instead of investing in your company's retirement account, taking that $1,000 a month and creating a cash value liquid asset of $654,000, which comes with a death benefit of 2.3 million. So we've got two assets taken from this dollar amount, one worth 2.3 million, one who knows what that uh, property that was uh, originally cost 179,000, 180,000, it's probably worth in 20 years, upwards of six, 700,000 itself in addition to the income that it, the income stream that it's producing. But we also have a vehicle. And again, there was no effort here. All we did was sleep well at night. All we did was put that thousand dollars a month away and allow it to do what this product naturally does. And that is produce income. And again, I stopped it at 55. What does it look like at 59? If we just get right up to retirement age, how about a millionaire? How about $100,000 in liquid cash producing $111,000 tax-free for life? Now, I want to throw another wrench in here, though. What if he did put that $1,000 that a month in his company's 401k? Right. And the reason he put that $1,000 in his company's 401k is because his company 401k said, or his company said, hey, we will give you a match. So instead of you putting your thousand dollars in a secure compound interest of vehicle like this and producing this hundred eleven thousand dollars in tax free income by fifty nine, you take that thousand dollars a month and you put it in your company's 401k and we're going to give you a match and I'll throw another wrench in it. Let's say that match is a hundred percent. You get a hundred percent match, meaning if you put in a thousand dollars this month, your company's going to match a thousand dollars, a hundred percent match because those companies do exist out there. So let's say you get that hundred percent match. 
How how common is that, honestly? Uh, those are for executives. Those are people with, uh, um, I'll call it golden handcuffs and executive parachutes. Mm. There are companies out there that will do a hundred percent match. Okay. But I, but I, so I just want to go very extreme here. Let's say you as a regular employee, as regular IT going into this job, they offer you a hundred percent match on your contributions. What that means is instead of a thousand dollars a month, it's actually, what's actually being contributed is $2,000 every month with a hundred percent match. If that were to happen at age, what is this? 59 note at age 59, you still can't touch your 401k though, but let's just, let's just ride with it. At age 59, you would have available to you $1.8 million in your 401k. You're almost a two time millionaire. And you're able to take as income because you had that 100% match, a good old $74,000 in tax-free income, 74,000. I'm sorry. Did I say tax-free? I'm sorry. No. That's 74,000 yeah. taxable. Yeah. So again, you got 1.8 million, 100% match and $74,000 taxable, 74,000 taxable. And Com it, but don't forget that the taxes that we will have to pay are going to have to make up for what is currently going on with the retirement crisis. And what we talked about last week was that was 13,000. Get on camera. Say it because you're, you're, you're preaching. You're it's, absolutely it's right. $13,600 extra per year per person that we will have to make up for in taxes to just fill in this deficit that's happening right now. If your income is taxable, then you are going to be taxed for the deficit that's happening. Now, there's two two factors. This is not just the people who are retiring now who will have to be more dependent on the system. They will have to come up with more solutions for them, uh, primarily because the healthcare and everything else is just getting uh, more expensive. And it's not a, there's no cap on it. They can just continue to charge what they want, right? Absolutely. So as their health care needs go up, they need more income anyway, and nobody was prepared to retire to have this level of, of lifestyle, this uh, cost to their lifestyle in 2023. They had funded their retirement plans with everything that they, everything that they, uh, that they promised them. But Honestly, remember how it was sold. Remember how it was sold. That, it, no, that's the point. That's the point. It was sold along with the meat and the jello that they thought was such a good idea and made a fancy meal. These are this is the same systems that were created at the same time that they were putting hot dogs in jello, saying that this is what you should do, this is the plan that you should have. Make it delicious. Uh this now has not only failed uh, an insane amount of people but it's going to continue to fail. And so now instead of them being accountable for what's happened, now they're putting things in place to try to make up for it. Well, who is paying for that? It's yeah. us, right? And so this is where when, when you're talking about, oh, and it's taxable income, tax deferred uh, growth, all of this is an open check for them to say how much they're going to take out of that. So not only as a stock market, and the brokers and the managers and all of those uh, and anyone re anyone involved in the fund management side of things, not only are they siphoning off and they're taking their cut, they're taking it today, right? They're taking That's it right. today, and now this is part of their income. They get to pay today's taxes on that income too. I guarantee you, they're living in a Roth environment. Guarantee. Oh, for yeah, yeah, very possible. Well, if this is their actual income, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then you go to because what they're saying is that in ten years, this this thirteen six will be implemented within the next ten years because it has to because we're 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 just we're bleeding out. There's no way that we can avoid it unless you have a system set up where you are living with within a Roth environment and your retirement funds or your income that you're dependent on is not taxable. Not taxable. And what I appreciate about self-directed account, and I don't know that I don't know if you went over this or if I was just looking at for the text messages with by the way, if you have a question, 
please put it in the chat. Or if you are watching from TV, we're trying to create uh, more things for people who are TV viewers to be able to participate. You can get out your phone and you can text it here. I have a QR code, but I have to change everything and it's gonna set off the confetti. So just here, here's the number. I wasn't that prepared today. We're gonna, we're gonna be awesome at this. Point is that if we do not get ourselves situated to at least have tax shelters, because for a lot of people, they're going, this is a tax deferred. Okay, well, at least I'm not paying taxes because if I have to pay taxes on all of my income right now, that'll put me into a different tax bracket and that'll be even worse for me right now, right? So that is a concern for people. And uh, I, I want you to just talk a little bit about how some people use self-directed particularly self-directed IRAs or 401ks as a tax shelter in that same way. And they're also able to benefit. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I want to make sure the, the message isn't lost here, though. Um, so if you with me and you, if you pull up the calculator real quick, I just want to make sure this message isn't lost here. OK. Um, and I will absolutely address the, the tax shelter piece. The piece that I just want to make sure is clear here is whether we're talking 100 percent match or not where we're talking about Roth or not. Meaning this is stating I've got $74,000 taxable. Let's say it's not. Let's say it's $74,000 tax-free. Let's say this $1.8 million is all Roth, 100% match. And again, you have to understand how it was sold. You don't want a secure compound interest account cause one, you won't have as much money early. You don't want to secure a compound interest account because can they do a hundred percent match? Can they match you dollar for dollar? You put in a thousand dollars a month. We'll put in a thousand dollars with you. Even in doing so, this $74,000 is still less. It's still less than a thousand dollars a month. Come on. It's still less. $1,000 a month without the 100% match, without it being tax-free in a, in a company's retirement account, this one point, this $111,000 is still tax-free. You're still a millionaire and you're still producing more income than what your company is capable of doing. And so to your point, how many people actually have a 100% match from their company? Very few. So what that means is 98, 99% of us who don't get a 100% match why are we continuing to continuing to contribute to these vehicles that don't serve us? I just want to make sure that that's not missed. Now, as it relates to whether you should be tax deferred or whether you should be tax free and how people actually use them being being tax deferred is really just a uh, it's a gimmick. It's a gimmick to entice you to create less of a tax burden on the company that you're with but actually put yourself in more of a tax, uh, a tax burden issue in the future. What you're doing is you're deferring your taxes until, and what you're doing is you're off, uh, allowing the government to have an open checkbook to be able to charge you whatever they want in the future. And so the best thing you can do for yourself is put yourself in a position where you're paying taxes today. Why? Because you know the tax rate today. You might not like the tax rate. You may not enjoy being bumped up to the 20% or the 30% bracket. I get it. But if you pay the taxes today, the likelihood of you paying that, that, uh, that, that 13, six or whatever that dollar amount was in the future or whatever that increased amount is that they choose, they can choose to charge you whatever the tax rate is they want. So rather than you being dependent on any of that, if you pay the taxes right now, and I get it that is saying that you're adding more income right now and you're paying more that you may than you may not than you may have. I, I, I don't I don't dis, discount that. But understand what you're doing. Not paying the taxes today is saying I am open to paying whatever it is tomorrow. And we've been conditioned to believe that tomorrow you won't need as much. Yeah. Tomorrow you'll be making less money anyway. Tomorrow you'll be borderline poor anyway. Tomorrow you won't need the house that you're in. Tomorrow, because you'll have less, you'll actually be paying less in taxes. Do you hear what's be, what you're being told? Because in the future you'll be poor, you can handle whatever that tax benefit or that tax burden would be. 
Is that what we're striving for? We're striving to have less, do less, be able to do less later? I don't think that's what we're striving for, but that's what we're being told. Well, and what happens if for the people who are not prepared, because they've already, they're already at that age. And we have a, we have a question here, because I yeah. think this is a great, a great example from Carl. Mr. Ogle, a 63 year old male, wants to contribute 1500 for six years with an additional 20,000 lump sum. What is the possible result? Yep. So, uh, Mr. Ogle, and again, I, I say this often, so I'm just going to repeat it for those who may not have heard me say it. Most of my clients in that, I'll call it 58 to 63, 65, 68 range. What we're talking about is supplemental income. And so, what is it? What would this look like in a vehicle like this to be able to produce that supplemental income knowing, hey, I'm not trying to hit six figures a year, but I am trying to add to what it is I currently do. So let's take a look at it. So again, 63. And I, I say this often as well. This There's a flaw in this calculator. That flaw is the lump sum that I put in, even though you said 20,000, the calculator is going to naturally take that 20,000 and cut it in half. My gut says you're saying $20,000, all of it right now. And I can build that for you. I just can't show you in this calculator. So the number that you're going to see will actually be higher. I just can't show it using that $20,000 lump sum. So it's going to cut it in half. And you said, uh, what is it? 15, no, 2000, $1,500 $1, a, a month. Yep. So $1,500 a month. And I did run this out till age 75. I am not saying you have to wait till 75. What I'm showing you is if you give your money time, this is what happens. So by age 75, we're talking about on top of Social Security, on top of your pension, on top of everything else, $29,000, almost $30,000 tax free for the rest of your life. You would have an asset worth $312,000 and you would, your initial death benefit, meaning if something were to happen to you on day one, if at age 64, something were to happen to you, your beneficiaries would receive 364,000. If you lived beyond that, your beneficiaries would receive somewhere around almost a million, 910,000 is what your death benefit would be on top of this 312, on top of this 20, $30,000, 29,580, that would, you would be able to take. And what this dollar amount is saying, if you were to take this dollar amount till age 90, you'd be taking $443,000 in retirement at this $30,000 a year starting at age 75. Um, and again, that means that death benefit will continue to increase. Okay, Carl, I have a question for you. Hope you're still on. Is, this, is Mr. Ogle a family member of yours? Because this is where I feel like these types of strategies, if you, when you don't know what you don't know, that part right there could be your leverage, like your greatest leverage. So for instance, let's go back and do the same thing. Let's say Carl, Mr. Ogle is like Carl's daddy and them or some somebody, okay? Maybe related anyway. Very important person living with them, maybe. I don't know, how do you qualify as, a, as an insurable interest? I'm saying Carl's an insurable interest for Mr. Ogle. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And this is where these this conversation is going to start getting really uncomfortable as our parents start to lose and run out of retirement funds because the they can't keep up with inflation they just did not have this in mind there was no way that they could have prepared for this especially like the working class people there's just no way they could have prepared or saved enough for this and imagine our kids the Gen Z generation, when they are uh, and and beyond, when they're trying to get up, they can barely even get into a house. Like there's just no way. That's a pipe dream at this point, and it's really really sad. So a lot of these things have to change so that we do have access to leverage. So let's show them just for Carl. What happens if uh, we have? I think Mr. I know where you're Ogle. trying to go. I think where you, I know where you're trying to yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. What if uh, Mr. Ogle? did a policy on a younger adult child or something like that. Is that where you're going? That he, that qualifies as insurable interest. Absolutely. Right? And so let's talk through insurable interest. What that means is um, if you as the 63 year old have insurable interest, meaning you have a spouse, 
Maybe you have a younger spouse. <clears throat> Maybe you have younger children. Maybe you have grandchildren or great grandchildren. Because of that insurable interest, meaning that ability to be able to insure others in your in your in your lifeline, you have the ability to open those policies on those individuals. Now, some you can actually own the policy. Some you can't. And here's what I mean. From an insurable interest perspective, if you're 63 and you have a, a, a child, and again, I hate saying child about adults, but anyway, if you have a child that's somewhere between the ages of 24 and, and, and lower, so 21, 24, 18, something like that, you could actually own the policies on those individuals. But let's say you have a child who is, um, let's call it in their mid thirties, let's call it 35. What would it look like if you were to do an MPI plan on that 35 year old? Well, you can't own the policy. So what that means is you can fund the policy for that 35 year old. So how do you fund that policy? Well, here's where we might introduce a trust. Maybe the trust owns the policy on the 35 year old and you as the trustee, meaning Mr. Ogle as the trustee, the 63 year old is the trustee of that trust and they determine how that income is distributed. But the piece I want to connect you to is this. Okay. It's if, 20, if 29,000, if 29,000 is what it looks like for a 63 year old start 30. from 63 year old to age 75, what does it look like for what's the age 30 for a 30 year old over that same 12 year period. So 30 year old for the same 12 year period doing the exact same dollar amount. So 30 year, 30 years old to 42, putting the same $20,000 lump sum, same $1,500 a month. Remember for the 63 year old, that was 29 something. Right. What does it look like for a 30 year old? Yep. There's an additional 15 grand, 16 grand of income on an annual basis that's, a, that's created just because this was done from an insurable interest perspective on someone who was younger. So instead of the 303,000 in uh in cash value it looks like an additional hundred thousand four hundred four thousand income of forty five one sixty now if the trust owned this policy then the trust can distribute that income but let's say they didn't let's say mr ogle funded this policy for carl and because mr ogle funded this policy for carl when carl when uh mr ogle was ready carl said hey here's your forty five thousand dollars tax free Thank you for funding this policy for me. And as Mr. Ogle starts taking that income for however long he lives, let's say he lives another, let's call it 20 plus years. This income would increase. It could do one of two things. It could increase over that 20, 20 year period or it stayed 45, 160. That's fine. But at the end of that 20 year period, guess what? Well, Carl on. has the ability to then continue contributing to this account. Carl has the ability to also take over this income for the life of the policy. Uh, you, you said you had a question or is there a comment or something? Because, you know, Lolo comes with the best questions every mm -hmm. single time and they're right on time too. So right where you are, I feel like this is the best question. She says, if I started taking contributions from an MPI and I, I and still contribute every month to the policy, will the income I receive from the policy increase over time or does it stay the same? So let's look at it. And uh, I'm going to do it a few different ways. Uh, what is, I think, what is 1500 times 12? I don't even know what that dollar amount is. I think it might be 18 grand or something like that. Yeah, just go but let, that. Let's just say whatever that dollar amount is, you continue contributing that 18 grand. Again, this is a machine. This is a machine that's currently producing $45,000 a year. If you currently contributing, currently keep contributing, what that means is instead of at 42, you start taking con uh, contributions, you continue that $1,500 a month or 18 grand a year till age 43, the number increases. So it absolutely increases every year as you continue to contribute. But I'm going to take an angle. What if you used this dollar amount to make the contribution? Meaning instead of you contributing 18 grand, what if you used 18 grand from this number, you use the machine to continue to make these contributions. So there instead of you contributing, the machine is doing it. And so, and what that means is now who cares what that age is? What does it look like at 45? What does it look like at 50? If I'm, if I'm never going to stop contributing, that means every year this continues to increase as the age increases. So therefore, what does this look like at 55? How about 65? 
Now, here's the truth about this process. The truth is you're going to get a point, hit a point where you will be max insured, meaning there is a maximum amount that you're able to contribute and you can't go over that. That maximum amount might be, um, you know, based it's, it's, it's based off insurance. So that maximum amount might be, let's call it um, five million dollars, meaning you won't be able to exceed five million dollars. So whatever that five million dollar mark would be, let's back this age down. Let's go to fifty five. OK, let's say at age fifty five, that's the maximum amount that you would be able to contribute into this policy, which means you will be forced or not allowed to put any more money in, which means, I'm sorry, but you'll have to take this $207,000 tax-free for life. Now, even though you can't buy any more life insurance, that doesn't mean the leverage didn't, that doesn't mean the leverage stopped growing. So what do you do with that leverage, even though you can't put it in your policy? Then you max fund other policies. Then the trust opens up other policies on grandkids on kids, on whoever's available, or you max fund your wife's policies. You, 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 meaning you have the leverage to do what you want. Maybe you take that leverage and you buy more duplexes in St. Louis. The leverage is still there. The leverage is still available. It just may not be able to go into this policy, which means you have uh, the, the full scope of the investment uh, uh, landscape to be able to invest in what you want. It's pretty powerful. When you want. Absolutely. Pretty powerful. Okay. Uh, Greg's asking, can a person with SSI and SSID make uh, qualify for MPI? Social uh, Security. Yep. So can someone older in age qualify for MPI or a secure compound interest account? The short answer is yes. Um, but it also gets to a point where the math doesn't make sense. And here's what I mean. Um, Super healthy 60 plus year old individual can absolutely qualify for an MPI plan. But just understand there's a certain cost of insurance that you have that Carl being 30 doesn't have. And that cost of insurance impacts the growth. That cost of insurance or just the cost of insurance is just a fee. That fee eats up the growth inside your policy. So does it mathematically make sense at that age? There may be other vehicles because of the cost of insurance. There may be other vehicles that can beat it. The difference between Carl's cost of insurance and that 60 plus year old is Carl has more time because he has more time. This vehicle of uh, the amount of leverage in this vehicle can surpass or eat up whatever that cost of insurance would be. The leverage becomes so large that the cost of insurance doesn't matter because you're making more money than that cost of insurance. So that's the key. The key is to make more money inside the policy that actually eats up or beats uh, that cost of insurance. Did you have a question? Yeah. Greg's saying he's 37 and he was wanting to know what it would be for him. He, uh, Greg, we also have to have a number to put in for the, the monthly amount, but let's just say it's the minimum for so 37. So I'm going to take out the lump sum 37 years old. I always run these out to age 65, just so you know, and I'm saying you have to wait till 65, but if you're 37 years old and you just put in your age, which is $370 a month, what does that look like? Well, by age 65, you would have uh, an asset or an opportunity to take income of around $60,000 a year tax-free for life. Um, you dump in a lump sum, you multi you double that dollar amount, like you do what you're currently doing inside of your company's 401k. Again, if you take, put that you same said, 370 inside said, of a 401k, what would it look like? 930, yes, 934. Yep, game over. Oh. oh, I wish I had a sound effect for that. I need that. You, you put in $934 a month, and I love that number because that number is quite random. You put in 900, but I know the reason you chose 934 is because from your budget perspective, that's what makes sense to you. That 935, $934 a month by age 65, we're talking 150,000 tax free. You've got $1.4 million in liquid asset available to you to be able to do what you want. Oh, I think he's asking because he's um, social security disability. Does he, could he qualify for an MPI plan too? Yep. So disability, the word disability. Um, I have, um, veterans who are, um, you know, receiving their veteran disability who also get approved 
for uh, life insurance products, so for secure compound interest accounts all the time. It depends on what the disability is. It depends on what the ailment is. If, if it's a chronic illness, it depends on what the chronic illness is. It really just depends. It's a case by case basis. It's based off age. It's based off health. It's based off income. And it is absolutely a case by case basis. Does that automatically disqualify you? It does not. It does not automatically disqualify you. Yep. Yeah, those are really great questions. Okay, we have um, another one from Carl. He's asking a follow up to the to the uh, example. Oh, OK, hold on before we get there. Jenny, if you want to learn more about MPI, we have a bunch of free resources that will tell you everything that you need to know. But if you don't want to wait, um, of course, we always share at, at the end of the live stream exactly where to go. But you can also go here. You can go here to learn more. You don't have to wait. And, we've and got the easiest thing to do, because uh, she's right, I focus heavy on education. So I would much rather you learn about MPI before you go get MPI. Let's learn about it. I want you yeah. to understand why this is different, why this grows better. What are the um, pieces to this puzzle that allows this to produce two, if not three times the income of that of your traditional retirement account? I want you to have the answers to those questions. And then when you're ready, th the process of actually getting a policy is so simple. It could be 11 minutes or it could be 30 minutes. It is very simple. And there's no cost to be able to just see if you qualify. There's no cost to apply for a secure compound interest account. There's no cost to you to do so. Uh, but you do have to be approved. You do have to be healthy. You do have to have a cash flow to be able to contribute. And you do have to meet the requirements of underwriting, but those are not hard things to do. And I can assist you with all of that. Okay. Carl's asking, are you saying that the growth ceases like at, at you get reach max funding? Okay. Max insurability. So uh, let me, let me uh, just give you some actual numbers. Um, let's see if we can do this. It's a good question, Carl. Yep. Absolutely. So let me give you some actual numbers. So let's say you are Carl's 30 years old. Let's say you're 30 years old and you currently make a hundred thousand dollars a year, 30 years old, hundred thousand dollars a year, your max insurability, meaning the maximum life insurance you would qualify for is 40 times your income, 40 times your income. If you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, 40,000 times your income is $4 million. So what that means is the maximum amount of life insurance that you qualify for is $4 million. That also, that $4 million also implies there's a maximum amount that you can contribute to your cash value life insurance product. Whether we're talking whole life, variable life, universal life, MPI, and IUL, doesn't matter. There's a maximum amount that you can contribute. Well, if it's $4 million in death benefit, then that $4 million translates to $100,000. Meaning the max you can put into a vehicle is a hundred thousand. Now, how you put in that hundred thousand matters. Cause think about it. If you make a hundred thousand, can you contribute a hundred thousand? No. And nor would the life insurance company allow you to, but right. if you had some type of lump sum and you had some type of monthly amount, those two things combined added up to your annual income of a hundred thousand is the max that you can contribute. So if you can put in a hundred thousand dollars, imagine what that would look like in income pretty quickly. But that, that's where that comes from. So it's just simply math. There's a, a maximum amount of insurable, uh, there's a max amount of insurance that you qualify for, and it's based off your age and your income, and that multiplier depends on your age. You're 30, that multiplier is 40. Uh, you're you're uh, 40 to 50 years old, that multiplier is 30. You're 50 to, I think, 55, maybe 50 to 60, that multiplier is 20. Above that, it's 10. So it just depends on what that multiplier is depending on your age. You're Hopefully saying you can't just go breaking bad Walter White out here at 60 something years old and then just dump a whole bunch of money in a policy. Well, let's talk about it because the reason these rules are in place is because of the breaking bads and the laundering of money. Mm. Life insurance has long it. been known to be the place where people launder money. So these mech limits and rules have been put in place 
to prevent the ability of people to be able to launder clean money through life insurance. So that's the reason these rules apply. That's the reason you have to go through underwriting. There was a time in the eighties where you didn't have to go through all of that. And that's where days. your Tony Montana's were cleaning money through life insurance to be able to accomplish their goals. So that's the reason these things are in place. And none of us knew we were eating bonbons, watching the prices, right? The more, you know, that's right. <laughs> Any other and, questions? Uh, and schoolhouse rock, probably most of us. Um, okay, Greg says, Angelique, is there a better way to talk to you guys? There is. There is. Right you don't here. like talking to us over on the live? Like, yeah, well, I mean, this is really the best place because we can Absolutely. answer you live right here in, mm -hmm. in real time. And, um, and wait a minute. Is he saying he wants to talk to both of us? We haven't done that. No, if you want a special request and you want me on your call, you got that would it. Be dope. That yeah, would be dope. you got it. You got to You got to let him know though. So I got. You can't just willy nilly. Can Angelique get on camera on a Zoom call? Don't that girl do that. Busy. that girl, you think she busy <laughs> producing on here? I don't know that she can make time for us. So I'm just saying. Yeah, I I can't I can't willy nilly out on a Zoom call, <laughs> ladies. Can you fill me on it? Okay. I work at a casino and we take a money laundering class. Ooh, this is interesting. Me Gina, too. We may need to have you on here. Me too. I, I'm required as a life, life licensed life insurance provider to take a money, money laundering class as well. Hmm. Absolutely. Nice. Okay, we had one from Clem. Hold on, Clem. At age 62, what's the largest lump sum amount that can be done? It depends on your income. If you're 62 and you make a half a million dollars a year, a half a million dollars times 20, 20, 62. Maybe it's a half a million dollars times 10. Uh, but roughly, here's the way you think about it. What's the max I can put inside of a life insurance product? Your income. The short answer to that question is your income. If you make $50,000 a year, the max you can put in, in essence, is about $50,000 a year. You make $250,000, that max is right around $250,000 a year. That's the maximum that you can contribute, regardless of your age, regardless of where you are in the spectrum, that max is right around what you make. I'm laughing because every time you're like, what is that number? Let's do math right now. I just am like, I'm here for emotional support because I shut down when you're like, let's do it right now. What's the number? I got you. And I'm just like, hmm, what is it? He's going to come up with it. I'm, I don't want to do it right calculator. now. I've always been your like calculator. It. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, I don't like it. I okay. Lolo's got good questions. Let's see what she mm -hmm. says. Uh, are the policies and your contributions insured in the case the life insurance company goes belly up? I love that yeah. question, hands down, because here's what people assume. People assume that because I offer a secure compound interest account, I must be a life insurance company. Mm. And I am not. Um, MPI or premium financing, premium financing is a strategy. That strategy is applied to a life insurance product. That life insurance product is purchased through a life insurance company. So who is the life insurance company? And this goes along, line, along the lines of some of the comments that I've answered under some of our videos. That life insurance company is Mutual of Omaha, M-O-O. -O. Google them. I do not work with your random mom and pop life insurance companies, nor do I work with a Prime America or Trans America for that matter. Um, we work with, I work with A plus rated life insurance companies who have been around since before the Great Depression. The life insurance company I partner with helped bail out the banks in 2008. Why does that matter? Well, the strength of the company that I work with matters because what is the likelihood of a company, an A plus rated life insurance company going out of business or going bankrupt or losing everything or your money not being secure? The likelihood of that is very low with a comp with an A plus rated life insurance company. And so uh, are the policies and your contributions insured? Let's start here. All IULs, not the secure comp, not just the secure comp, uh, secure comp, I can't even get the word out. Not just the secure compound interest account that I'm talking about. All IULs have a 0% floor if you buy the ones that do. That 0% floor means it's a contractual guarantee 
from the life insurance company. The life insurance company guarantees any money you contribute that goes into that general fund. And when it hits that general fund, that general fund is protected by the 0% floor, which means you're protected from market risk. Ultimately meaning you can't lose the money you put in that bucket. And any growth on the money that you make, any growth on that money that goes in that bucket as well becomes brand new principal. And it's the contractual guarantee that you can't lose that. So are the policies and your contributions insured? I think what you're saying, are they FDIC insured? This is not a bank. This is a life insurance company. So this guarantee is provided to you from the life insurance company. Well, where are they getting their money from? They're getting their money from the general fund. What is the general fund tied to? The Fed. What is the Fed? AAA rated bonds. How are FDIC insured? Notice FDIC insured. FDIC insured meaning your money in a bank is insured by a life insurance company. So if banks money is FDIC insured and your insurance based money is insured by the insurance company, I think that answers the question. Is your contributions insured? Absolutely. And the, again, the life insurance company we use is an A plus rated life insurance company and the likelihood of it going belly up is quite low. Good question. Um, I tried to push the button. It's a lot, of words. A lot of it words. It is a lot of words. To say yes. Somebody Could've just left us yes. a voicemail, so I've got to go listen to it before we play it. But oh, I really it might wanted. Be or something. I don't know, but I, I thought it. Man, be your fun. forehead is so huge, but I do like listening to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and just so we're clear, I'm okay if you play that because I get it. Right? I think my forehead is big, so golly. Well, yeah. mine too. I mean, clearly, but it's just whatever the feedback is we really want the feedback and it is no a doubt. it is a better way to like leave us because we can hear the tone in your voice right it's easier than typing out all the words especially for people who watch on tv i think that would be easier for them to just pick up their phone and leave us a voicemail i think that'd be dope so while you're doing that what i could do is because I, I think we're at a point where we can wrap this up i just want to make sure it's clear so if you throw me back over to the side of the board if you want to take a look i can absolutely just i just want to put a bow on this thing that's all well, Up can you. you do it a bow after Cynthia's comment? Yeah, let's do it. She has a question. Okay. Let's do it. Hi, Cynthia. Yeah. Hi, Cynthia. And thanks for watching, everyone. Um, okay. If you want to open a policy for an 18-year-old child and they are in college and don't have a job, how do they determine the maximum, yep. i.e. $4 million max for a 100 k year job? And, and this is where, uh, well, how do they determine the maximum? Uh, for 100k a year job, I think if I understand, I don't think you're saying the 18 year old has 100k a year. I don't think that's what you're saying. But no. since she's what? saying, like, how do they determine their max insurability? Okay, if got they it. Don't got have it. a job. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So this is where insurable interest comes into play. Um, the minimum, based off max insurability for a, I'll call it, um, 18 year olds on adolescents. For an 18 year old that you have insurable interest over, that maximum is a half a million dollars. So the, the bare bones maximum for a, um, a 18 year old who has no income and we can't calculate that max insurability, that, that, that maximum is a half a million dollars. Now we can increase that based off how much the parents have, but it starts at a half a million. So it would be a half a million dollars. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a multiplier that can determine how much monthly that would equate to for an 18 year old. I don't have the uh, tool that I would need to be able to determine what a half a million dollars for an 18 year old would max, what that maximum amount would be uh, monthly. I could work backwards using the calculator to do it, but there's a, there's a divisor that would allow me to calculate that. And I can't, I can't do it right here. So. Yeah, but, but if Cynthia, if you want to see what that exactly what that would look like, the best thing to do would would be to book a call with Donnell and then he can build you out what that exactly what that would look like. Yep, absolutely. And like I said, I can work backwards. But what that would mean is I would put in 18, put in a retirement age and just throw in numbers to identify when do I hit that half a million dollars in life insurance. And that would tell you what that dollar amount would be. Greg's, Greg's got some comments in here, and mm -hmm. I just want to address this one piece because it is something that is close uh, to my heart anyway. It's around pe when, when something happens in your life and your health is not in the best shape, and then you're going, okay, now what? 
none of us are expecting for these things to happen, of course. And so we're not prepared. We think we're going to be the odd, those types of things aren't going to happen to us, right? Um, Part of our story is just that uh, two years ago, I started to lose my vision. And I haven't driven in, well, maybe it's three years now, right? Somewhere around there. Yeah. So I haven't driven since then, since I realized like, oh, I can't see, see, like I can't be driving either because my eyes wouldn't focus. And I didn't, I thought maybe, okay, I just need to go see a doctor and they're going to fix it. And then we'll get back on with life because I've got stuff to do. Like I'm on a mission. I've got such a zest for life. Like this isn't going to happen to me. I'm not going to go blind. But a lot of doctors that I talked to said, there's nothing that we can do to help you. This is just what's going to happen to you. And if we didn't know some of these uh, tools that we could be creative with, and we didn't know some of these strategies that aren't dependent on uh, these traditional qualifiers. That's the word, non-traditional actions, outside the box, not what you're being at, what's not, not what's being advertised. Right, right. And then I would not qualify for a lot of stuff and I would not be able to contribute. Now, the emotional weight that someone carries when they feel like not only are they not enough, they can't qualify to be enough to get out there and make something different because of some factor that they have no control over, right? But also that at some point, they're not gonna have enough. And who is out there looking out for you other than you if you're, especially if you're out there on your own? This is a very sad time in America right now because a lot of the people who are in this type of position, just it just so happened that it happened to them. It wasn't that they didn't have a zest for life or that they didn't have a plan or that they didn't go to college because they had all those plans. It was that this is just the cards that were, were given to them and, and the options are just on crumpled brochures somewhere collecting dust in the back office because someone's really, it's not even that they're too lazy to share it. It's because we people have been in positions for years to gatekeep the information that we get based off of how they profit. That's it. They get to decide if, if this is even important for us to know, because if it's not beneficial for them to tell you, then you probably aren't going to hear it. It's not going to be worth their time. Even if it's, even if it is worth all of your time, right? To hear that 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 type of information, these these um these strategies, just being non traditional in, in uh, how they're structured, being non traditional in the ways that you can use them and leverage them. I I do want to go back so that you can finish some of these because I think what I'm about to start talking about is what you actually had on there, which was the type of things that you could invest in. And when you see an opportunity being able to strike while the iron's hot, when that opportunity is hot, and then because that's when it is, right? When that house is uh, priced the way that it is, when the market looks like this and you go, you know what, I could buy this duplex and I can put my kids in that, right? I could buy this house and I can put my my parents in that. When you have those opportunities, that's when you need to be able to leverage to take advantage of them. But sometimes because we have to uh, go through all of the motions of these traditional systems, that's where the math does not make sense anymore because we're penalized by trying to improve our our lives. Right. How, why is this a thing? And you can do the most, the, your best to try and you can just try to do your best. And if you're still working with a system that was never designed for you to win, then you're just spinning your wheels for nothing. And that, that's the most frustrating part is that this should be, everyone should know these tools. Okay, let's get back in and... Um, and I'm going to have some water because I need some, clearly. <laughs> okay, well, let me um, put change this out. Okay. So what do you want, the vibe board? Yeah. Okay, all right, here we go. Oh, the half. Okay, is this yeah, it, yeah, though? It. Yep, Are we yep, here? We're good. Yep, we're good. Okay. So uh, ultimately, so again, we were talking about the retirement crisis, right? 
the retirement crisis being, hey, uh, your current retirement account is in trouble uh, because of the state of the economy, state of this country, whatever the case may be. And the thought process is this, what actions can you take to be able to counter this crisis? And the key is to reduce the risk because what you know of as your traditional retirement account is currently tied to the market. And because the risk is in the market, the objective is can you uh, reduce that risk by moving that money elsewhere? So all we wanted to do today was just highlight if you were to take action using a, um, a self-directed retirement account to be able to put your money in a different position. But we, what we also wanted to make clear is there's a lot of other non-traditional actions that's available to you that you don't hear about. There's not a lot of people talking about velocity banking from the perspective of it being a mainstream activity that you can use to be able to increase your cash flow. The reason we talk about it is because without velocity banking, we would not be where we are. It was, it was taking it was borrowing against our self-directed 401k at, with a lump sum to be able to reduce our debt, to be able to do velocity banking, and then getting a whole life policy, because I didn't understand MPI at the point, getting a whole life policy that allowed us to do infinite banking. So taking borrowing money here to be able to do velocity banking, to increase cash flow, to get us a cash value life insurance product that allowed us to leverage put us in a position to be able to replace our mortgage with a first position HELOC and using the equity inside of this first position HELOC to supercharge our MPI plan to now, regardless of what happens with traditional retirement planning, we've got a vehicle that is producing tax-free income for life. So it's being able to use all of these vehicles and allowing all of these vehicles to talk, to be able to produce uninterrupted compound interest for life. So it was taking that traditional retirement account, getting it out of the market. But we, what we're currently investing in with our self-directed 401k is self-storage facilities and an apartment complex in Bisbee that we're trying to sell. So if you're wanting to invest in real estate in Bisbee, there's a apartment complex that we're trying to get rid of so that I can get my self-directed retirement account dollars out of it. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what? And, and here's why we're invested in those. I I have learned that tenants, toilets, and trash are more hassle than they are help. Meaning if I could eliminate tenants, toilets, and trash and invest in self-storage, which is just three walls and a door, there's more money to be made there passively than the active investing of real estate. Not to say anything to my active investors who love real estate investing, go do your bird method, man, rock out. I personally just want to sleep well at night knowing money is making money for me. So where do I do that? I do that with my self-directed 401k investing passively. I do that with my uh, uh, MPI plan, my premium finance strategy that all we do is contribute and it builds money passively. These other three items are non-traditional approaches to be able to create the cash flow necessary to be able to do so. So how do you overcome this crisis? You reduce risk. What actions can you take to reduce risk? You just simply get self-directed. What do you what actions do you take to be able to reduce that risk that's happening inside of this retirement crisis? Take control, get self-directed, put your money in a position so that your money can now work for you instead of you working for it. That's it. And how about this? These aren't the only actions that you can take. There are other actions available to you. But what it takes is you taking control. Any other questions, sweetheart? Man, mm -hmm. I thought you were going to go over the list of what you could invest in with a uh, self-directed 401k, but that's okay because I want to play what something special that happened today. <laughs> and I want to also encourage others to leave us. Is this a pay phone? Am I a pay no, 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 it is. It's a hand. It's, it's a, it's a mobile. Phone. I thought, I thought we were in a pay. You know what would have been dope if we had a pay phone with a rotary, you know? Like oh Yeah. Anyway. Except for that, it takes up screen time, and I got to think about all that stuff. So, well, and also, I've read more. To, there's a lot of people on here that wouldn't even know what that was. Yeah. No, I think we have our people watching. I think I think they do. So here's what we did: mm -hmm. we put a QR code up for those who are watching on computer or the TV, and we think it's amazing that we have 32 percent of our viewers watch from the TV. So that's that's for you guys. Right there. Right there. Yeah, right there. And then you can go there, hit the button up from your phone, 
when you get there and then scroll to the bottom. Hit the hard. button, call us and leave us a voicemail message. Uh, Greg said he wishes he could afford a one-on-one -on -one call with us. What? Afford? He used the word afford? He did. Well, you are expensive. Like, let's just be clear. I cost nothing, but you are quite expensive. It, it, so yeah, how much is it, Donnell, to get on the phone with you? Zero. It costs nothing. Um, free. Free 99. And here's, here's my thought process on that. Um, and let's be clear what we're, what we're talking about. Uh, I want to understand why you want to have a discussion with me. So I'm going to peel layers back around you putting time on my calendar. But let's be clear. Velocity banking is a strategy. What is there to charge to talk through a strategy? Nothing. Infinite banking is a strategy. Now, in order to do infinite banking, you need a, a vehicle to be able to do infinite banking. That has a price to it. But talking through the strategy, there's nothing there either. Um, a first position HELOC. I'm not a bank. I cannot, I cannot give you, provide to you a, a first position HELOC. That would require a bank. Now, we can talk through the strategy, but there's no cost associated with that. And again, uh, the other item is a self-directed IRA or 401k and a secure compound interest account in the form of premium financing like MPI. Those are products. Those are products that do have a price to them, but understanding how they work. Hopefully, I would have answered all of those questions before we even meet. So the whole purpose for getting on a call with me or a call with us would be to how do I execute? How do I get a self-directed IRA or 401k? How do I get a premium finance strategy? The cost to get those things, there's no cost to get, meaning to apply for a, a premium finance strategy. The cost comes into play when, what is a premium finance strategy? It's a life insurance product. That's where the cost comes into play. You pay me nothing. You pay the life insurance company to be able to have that life insurance product. I apply that strategy. My cost, the cost of me comes from that life insurance company that we get that premium finance strategy from. So to get on a call with me, it doesn't cost anything. My ask is that you'll be very clear as to what your needs are. And we hopefully can address those needs before we even get on a call. Yeah. And get the velocity banking uh, worksheet worksheet. If, if what you're wanting is a consultation for that and have your numbers ready. Okay. I want to play this because you just talked about all five of the strategies and now we've at least mentioned all of them, even though we haven't done videos or live streams to go deep dives into every single one. We've done quite a few on velocity banking, though. We've mentioned infinite banking inside of there and we've gone pretty deep inside uh, down the first position HELOC rabbit hole. So somebody somebody took notice it's um somebody from first savings bank in indiana that's what's up and let's listen let's take a listen or done it dang it okay wait S scratch that we're starting over i didn't Rewind. have the volume up it's all good just pretend like this is the first time you guys are excited to listen can you hear it okay Hi, uh, my name is Anthony Rushing. I'm calling for Donnell. Um, I have seen your videos um, all over online, and I uh, just wanted to reach out and touch base and see if there'd be any chance that, that I could get you on the phone or may, maybe find some time to chat. Um, I work with a bank called First Savings Bank, um, and we're out of Indiana, and, and our branch, uh, I guess my boss, uh, he built a, a first thing HELOC here specifically for people that want to use Velocity Banking. That's um, huge. And um, That's huge. We, uh, we teach the strategy um, and understand how it works. Our branch is the only branch that can do the loans, and we're really just trying to connect with good people, uh, mainly good people, uh, that's kind of the, the, uh, the, the main deal, but um, who are in the space and who understand it. Um, and you re your videos really stuck out to me. And so I just wanted to call and introduce myself and see if I could maybe uh, – you know, get a few minutes of your time to learn more about kind of what you do and, you know, what, what your what your goals are and where you'd like to bring your business um, and see if there's any, you know, place where we align. And Anyway. That's huge. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it out here. That's Anthony Rushing from First Savings Bank of Indiana. And I love 615-716-9090. We're just going to throw it out Don't there and give him up. some love Jeez. because – 
who's out there really trying to uh, create solutions for people. But let's peel it back. It's a first position HELOC product specifically designed for velocity banking. Right. How many comments have we received that said velocity banking is a scam? Let's start yeah. there. Let's start. Let's start to start right there. And again, we're talking math. This is a uh, this is a, a, a banking institution that has specifically designed a first position HELOC. How many how much how many comments did we get around having a first position HELOC doesn't make sense compared to a mortgage? You meaning I'm going to get a 7 percent interest rate instead of a 4 percent mortgage like that math doesn't math like this is huge. Right. And, and I think it speaks volumes to th there's a, there's an evolution happening. Again, if we if you remember that timeline I had, there's the Social Security era, there's the pension era, there's the 401k era. We are headed into an era where people are understanding that there are other tools required. People are wanting to take more control over where they're going. People need vehicles outside of traditional retirement vehicles, traditional investment vehicles tied to the market. And there are institutions that are understanding, you know what? We need to evolve the life insurance company that we work with the a plus rated life insurance company we work with for our premium finance strategies have to be willing to take less money up front right. in order to put you in a position so that you can make more money what institutions you know that are focused on making money are willing to take less up front so that they can do right by you this is huge right. now we're talking about a bank who are specifically designing, again, how do banks make their money? They make their money off arbitrage. They make their money off loan, uh, amortized loans, so they can get all of their money up front, so that they on the back end is when you start getting money from them. But they, they get all of theirs up front because that's where they make the most. They have designed a first position HELOC uh, product that is designed for velocity banking. Again, the words alone are huge because how many banks out there are doing it? It's huge. Yeah, uh, for the, the fact that this is somebody in Indiana, we're in Arizona, so that's kind of amazing that he can, he says uh, he's seen you all over the internet, so it's not even just here on YouTube. Uh, for him to be able to reach out and say, hey, I see you, I see what you're doing, I, we, we get it over here. Like we're trying to be different. We are trying to, to uh, create solutions. And man, wasn't it a breath of fresh air to see your videos and see how you're teaching this stuff because people do need to know and we want them to know that we, we also are here. We said in so many different videos that this is something you should prepare yourself to walk into a bank and for them to go, you don't want this. Uh, we don't offer it, probably not. Uh, we'll get back to you because they don't want to even talk about a first position HELOC with you. So I agree. We are donning a new era for sure. Speaking of eras, do you want to show them like where at least like the history of retirement plans, why we're here, but that we are moving into a different era, which is why we require different tools. Do you have you know, that did, up? You know, I did that already, but yes, I'll do it again. Well, I don't know what I was doing. I was probably reading <laughs> comments or something. No problem. Are you sure? Do you guys remember it? Because you sure did. Oh, I sure did. <laughs> like I remember. Okay, you sure did. My bad. We'll pull it up. Go ahead. We can talk about it. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do just want to revisit yeah. this part because I think it for for Anthony rushing who just called and left that message, and I really appreciate what he had to say, and I think. We have to find more people like that to understand where are these people who do care, where you're not going to have to go in and fight for yourself. But let's talk about that, because I, I keep telling people I am not a bank. I do not offer first position HELOCs. But what I can offer you is a white glove service to be able to figure out how. And there is an entire community who has already done the work, meaning on a daily basis, they call banks to identify where the uh, promotional rates are. 
on a daily basis. They talk to banks They talk to the individual at that branch who actually understands this, this strategy and how to use it. And I'm confident Anthony's probably already on that list of banks. Mm. So there is white glove service out there if you need it. It's just not something that I can provide. And so, uh, so I think this, there, there are banks who are willing. They're just not advertising it because I go back to they don't make as much money. So for Anthony kind of step out there and, and just, hey, this is what we do. And it's specifically designed for what it is you're trying to do. That's powerful, man. It's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful. And we're more than happy to give somebody a shout out. You are trying to level up. This is the place to get real start to slow clap for you. So hold on one second. Let me, I'll put you on the whiteboard. All right. All right. So as I was mentioning, um, you know, that 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 pension error is something that most of us, majority of Americans do not get. But the problem is the institutions that are telling us to continue putting your money here. They're the ones that are actually benefiting from pension type products. So there's the pension error. There's the Social Security error. There's the 401k error is what we're in the midst in midst of right now. But th that's also the error that's created this retirement crisis. And it's because what <clears throat> what we think is a savings plan is actually an investment plan. Remember the, the equation. It's an investment plan because of risk. The objective is to be able to reduce that risk and put us in a position where what? Where we have more control. SDRP is just saying a self-directed retirement plan, and that ultimately means control taking control over your current situation, taking more control over your retirement dollars, taking more control so that you can actually achieve your goals without the impact of the market. That's the whole objective here, control. Being, putting yourself in a position so you have access to your money to be able to put it where you want. And how about this? Let's say you have a self-directed retirement account and that self-directed retirement account is bringing you a uh, passive cash flow through real estate. And because you're good at day trading, you still want to put your retirement dollars or a portion of your retirement dollars into the market because you do it well. Because you have control over your money, you have the ability to still do that. Even if it's something that you're strong at being able to do. My point is control is control, meaning you have the ability to put your money where you want it. And you're not dependent upon Morgan Stanley or Fidelity, who we have learned don't have your back. You're not dependent on what it is they they have in store for you. And if you are a small business owner and you want to put your employees in a position to where they can have more control, your, your employees can have their own self-directed retirement account. Your employees can have their own premium finance strategy uh, tied to your business so that you can get out of out from under SEP IRAs and traditional retirement accounts that are tied to custodians who don't have your best interest. These secure compound interest accounts, these self-directed retirement plans can absolutely be applied to your business. So this is just not limited to the individual. Your business, matter of fact, I'm in talks right now. Your business can have their own secure compound interest account. Your business can have their own self-directed 401k. And the, the individuals in your business who have their own self-directed 401k can have full control to invest in what they want. So there's many options out here. Well, Lola was saying she saw somebody being interviewed from First Service, First, First Savings. Savings Bank on Denzel's channel. So that's really good if they're reaching out and they want to let let it be known that they are serving in this way. I think that's smart to do, especially today's day and age to do that. So maybe we'll have them on as a guest to ask them a bunch of questions. Um, OK, so I think this is a good time to wrap it up. We have a ton of free resources for those who have maybe your first time tuning in or maybe it's not your first time tuning in, but you haven't yet jumped in and got the free resources. If anything else, grab the book. The book, Why Everyone Ends Up Poor, is a wealth of, of information and it's a unique perspective that really helps to understand what the retirement crisis is really what it's talking about. It's talking about doing your best. It's talking about if you could do all of the steps perfectly, perfectly, and still end up poor. And it's not okay. But this is why, and this is why it's legal for people to get to the end of the rope 
and have to retire on hope. That's not okay, but that's not gonna be you because you're here with us. And we are here, here to help you take control and get self-directed. So on that note, um, well, we have a comment coming in. Hold on, oh, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. We really appreciate everyone who tunes in. Of course, we can only thank the ones that we know are in the chat, so by name. However, we know that all, uh, all of you watching, however you're watching, we appreciate you spending your time with us. And we don't take that for granted could, because we know that time is the most valuable asset that we all have. So on that note, we believe that even if you didn't come from a wealthy family, you can make sure that a wealthy family comes from you. So stay focused. Stay protected. Stay tuned in. Stay connected. I'm Angelique. And I'm Donnell. And our mission is to help you get self-directed. <laughs> Hold on one second, guys. Uh, we'll show you how to get those resources now. Hey, before you go, we want to remind you that becoming fully self-directed means gaining complete control over your wealth, time, and freedom. It's not just an idea. It's a framework, a mindset, and the power to make informed decisions to secure your future. Being here means you're taking those steps, and we want to thank you for allowing us to guide you. We believe that we grow farther and faster when we grow together. So tune in next time and tell a friend to tell a friend. We've helped thousands of people just like you start their journey to financial freedom. And if they can do it, you can too. And if you're ready to learn more, we got you. Get a head start by grabbing these two free books. But how do they get them, Donnell? Head over to my website where you'll have access to a few things. A ton of free resources, case studies, and over 100 five-star reviews from people just like you. And in 15 minutes, we can explore what's possible for you. So don't wait. Invest, Invest in what, what you want, want, when you want. want. But first, let us help you get, get self-directed. Self -directed.